people experience with the, uh, the terrain. Um, I'm hoping that they will be able to give us a feel of how the technology is uh, uh, doing on the terrain and uh, what are their successes and uh, maybe also their frustrations so that on the second part um, we will have uh, drone makers talking about their products and their technologies and how they address said frustrations. Um, I will have um, the speakers that you see uh, come and present shortly. Um, I will ask that if you have questions for the speakers, you hold on to them, you keep them in mind, and we'll keep them for um, a, a panel discussion that will um, happen after uh, those uh, six speakers um, uh, have presented. Uh, once those speakers are done, they will sit here, wait for the other ones, and when the panel is uh, complete, we'll have a discussion, and I'll be sure to uh, uh, give the mic to the, um, to the floor so that you can ask your questions. So without further ado, I will call to um, the floor, I will call Israel Bimpe, he's a general manager of Zipline. He's been uh, instru instrumental in uh, setting up their, uh, and running the, their operation uh, here in uh, Rwanda. Welcome. Thank you so much and good afternoon everyone. Um, I didn't prepare slides because I believe most of you will have the opportunity. Uh, you either visited Zipline uh, before coming here or you will probably visit over the weekend. And I encourage all of those of you who haven't planned to really make sure that you visit. Uh, but I'm also so sure you've heard and know about Zipline and what we do and, and what our work is about. Uh, just one disclaimer, I'm not the Zipline general manager. Uh, however, uh, previous, you know, until uh, mid last year, I was in charge of integrating Zipline into the healthcare system here in Rwanda, uh, making sure we also integrated into the aviation uh, airspace regulation and, and everything. And now I moved on to a more global role position where I oversee how Zipline gets to build uh, our services to be able to satisfy all the national and you know, private uh, healthcare companies that we get to work with when we expand our services, whether in Rwanda or in other countries. And, and today I just wanted, from an operation perspective, I really wanted to share some stories and, and learnings and, uh, and what Zipline has been doing and what we've been learning uh, so far. And, and it's pretty much covering two areas. One is you know, on the operation side and the healthcare side, but the other is more on the core of flight operations and what we get to do. Um, and you know, when we started delivering, in, we started operating here in Rwanda in 2016. Uh, and, and in October 2016, we started delivering blood uh, to a few hospitals in the western part of the country. Uh, one of the things that we quickly learned when we did that is uh, hospitals started relying on us. Um, and we really completely transitioned the delivery of, med of blood products uh, from the national supply chain, trucks, buses, or anything that was doing it before, entirely to rely on Zipline. And, and we, we, it, it was an awakening moment because we started realizing that we not only have to build a strong and reliable uh, drone technology, so the drone and all the systems that support it, but also we really had to build uh, a strong and reliable kind of fulfillment service where we have nurses, pharmacists, and, and operators who can be able to build that side of things. And, and you know, quick forward two years after, we started now delivering medical products. And when we moved into medical products, that's when we realized that there is a need to literally build a new uh, part of the company, which what, what we call fulfillment as a service, which is now uh, how do we go out there and integrate our services in uh, private and public health systems. When we are working with the national health system in Rwanda, a Zipline operates at scale. We deliver to you know, dozens of hospitals uh, from two distribution centers, north, south, and everywhere. So we really had to make sure that we nail the aspect of being able to integrate in a system that is already existing in the country and be able to not be a silo on the side, but more of um, something that adds value to the health system here. And so we, we, we kind of had to build a whole fulfillment system that integrates adequately in the information flow in the um, you know, money flow and products flow on how those kind of get to work and, and what that uh, add to the operation. 
Um, and, and that kind of realized that we are no longer a drone operator only, but we are more of a medical delivery service. And, and that means that we don't only, you know, we are threading a, a very tough intersection of two highly regulated industries. One is healthcare and the other is aviation. And, and we really have, as much as we have to really have a strong reliability in terms of how we fly in the country, how we integrate with the aviation system, you know, how doing hundreds of flights per day, but we also have to look on the other side of our warehouse. They have to follow all the pharmaceutical and health requirements like being GMP certified and GDP certified and so on. Um, the, the second thing that uh, I, I wanted to talk about is, uh, you know, when this type of operation gets ongoing, uh, I, I don't know if anyone at Zipline was expecting, we had dreams really, we had dreams to make a hundred deliveries a day, we had dreams to operate, I don't know, dozens of planes at the same time. Uh, I, I remember at some point we were unable to build our system to be able to recover a plane and launch another one at the same time. And, and those were things that were so far. And then when all those started happening, that's when we realized that our system now has to be much stronger and we have to build operation to really handle much more than what we currently do. And, and some examples that I will tell you is, you know, how we, we try to work to continually adapt our technology and systems to the challenge of the operating environment, uh, not only running and operations. Uh, for those of you who visited us, you saw that our distribution center is pretty much an airport. Uh, to be able to input really rigorous processes, training mechanisms, uh, SOPs, and, and everything. Some of them follow aviation standards, but some of them are also our own internal operation standards that we have to set. Because when you start being very uh, dependable and reliable for the health facilities, you really have to make sure that your operation is fail safe, is fault safe, to be able to uh, rely on that. And maybe a few examples that I will give you on, on what it is that we kind of uh, d did and, and how we've learned and what we've uh, approached these uh, different options. So I'll, I'll first start with uh, high volume traffic management. Um, our, we, today we are able to be able to have about you know, 15, 16, 17 flights at the same time. So you know, you have a hospital requesting an order, there is a mass casualty accident that just happened somewhere, and a particular hospital need, let's say, 20 units of blood. You know, and for those, if each box, each zip can carry about four or five units, then you have to send five or six of them. Uh, how do you build your system to be fail safe enough to be able to handle such a, a high volume and traffic management system? Um, and, and some of those things are, you know, the technology part of things, which is, you know, the drone makers, what they will talk about, but how do you build the GPS and communication system and so on, but also on the operation side of things, because we started realizing that a lot of human errors were causing our operation to, you know, go out or something like that. And so we instituted, uh, first of all, like, you know, very rigorous standards of operation and how we do things, but then we also started doing a, an academy, pretty much a training institute and, and training facilities where all employees of Zipline who comes to join Zipline, they come in in Rwanda and spend about two to three weeks uh, ongoing a very rigorous training. No one ever passes that exam at the first go. And, and that rigorous training really ensure that everyone knows that to which uh, levels that they have to hold themselves when it comes to safety and what it is that they do. And when you talk about high volume traffic management, you have also to look at how do you integrate within the airspace? Um, and you have some protected airspace. You are, you know, uh, flying above cities, above schools, and you know there are helicopters also flying around. And how do you do that? Initially, uh, what, what Zipline did is we, we really wanted to be part of the integration in the airspace. We we had to communicate with air traffic control to be able to get clearance whenever we have to fly to maintain communication with the air traffic control if we have to return uh, our flight, if we have to hold our flight in a zone, or if we have to terminate the flight in a certain area because there is an imminent collision or something like that. Uh, and, and some of those things also has to do with how we do our route planning and safety assessment. Um, Zipline flies on pre-planned flight routes. We have some principles that we follow to be able to design uh, the routes. And, and some of those, you know, 
is either set by the Civil Aviation Authority, but others are also set for us to be able to respect uh, our, our own internal uh, reliability. And, and maybe the last point is on how to build reliable hardware for different weather and weather adverse areas. And, and usually, you know, we couldn't know that some places in Rwanda have strong downdrafts, for example. And all we had to do is to be able to collect enough data from the flights that we're currently uh, doing and be able to build a system that is uh, really strongly reliable and build the mechanism to be able to quickly change our routes and get them approved and establish that uh, accompaniment and that you know, ongoing collaboration with the regulators to be able to do that. Uh, I look forward to take questions and, and be able to answer more and speak on some specificity of our operations, but I just wanted to kind of uh, speak on these brief areas uh, of our operation and what we, we do in that. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Israel. Uh, so as I, uh, as I said, we will be uh, taking questions for Israel and the other speakers uh, during the panel discussion. So I now uh, call to uh, the stage Eric Rutayazayore from Cheris um, UAS. And please correct my pronunciation of your name if it's uh, bad, uh, which I'm sure it is. Uh, thank you very much. My name uh, is Eric Rutaisire, and I'm a founder and CEO of Caris uh, uh, UIS uh, uh, is a drone company. Um, Thank you very much. Uh, that video sums up a little bit what uh, Caris does uh, all, all over Africa. And uh, for my presentation, uh, I wanted to talk about um, uh, a use case, uh, a, an innovative way we are using uh, machine learning and drones in fighting against uh, malaria. Um, so I'm going to go through uh, what exactly we're doing there. So uh, we'll go over the you know, problem statement, uh, the current solution around uh, that are out there and the proposed solution that we have and that we've been conducting, especially in the cases of uh, Rwanda. We use Rwanda as a specific uh, use case in this case and then uh, a little bit of a conclusion to that. So uh, recently, based on the data from the ministry, we've seen that there is an increase in uh, uh, malaria cases. And most of the time is because the uh, mosquitoes have uh, actually uh, change behavior then started by biting people even you know outside uh, outdoors and during the day before it was mostly during the night and so that case uh, has really raised concern on how we can fight back there was a point where uh, Mal uh, Rwanda almost uh, was declared malaria uh, free but re in recent cases we have seen an increase a tremendous increase 
So these are the cases. I'm not sure if you can see it well. These are data for so sometime in 2016. You could see, and in different parts of the, of the country, how the issue has been, you know, growing uh, from the from the past years, and how uh, it has been growing uh, during these years. And obviously, in the latest uh, um, years, it became a bit worse. So it's in that um, uh, framework where uh, Caris, as a company uh, which really tries to use, um, to integrate uh, drone and various uh, systems to solve existing problems that we, we, we felt like we can step in and, and, and do something about it. So there were many uh, interventions you know, around uh, our country. Uh, there were indoor residual spraying, uh, basically spraying in the in, in the houses, which is still going on. Uh, there were also a long-lasting insecticide uh, nets, which is also one part of the intervention that are happening. And uh, obviously, diagnostic and testing uh, various malaria uh, medicine. And the last part was now larviciding and spatial spraying. And in that case, it was mostly a manual way uh, people were doing that. And I'm gonna single out that the last part and talk about um, the current, you know, drone-based intervention. We know all around the world there's a buzz about um, uh, using drone in spraying, especially in wetlands or in rice fields, where uh, they are mostly, you know, a mosquito breeding, breeding site. And most of these solutions talk about a, 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 I would call it a, a, a major spraying of over the field, the whole field, and we've done that as well, but we've found some limitation in that area and some, uh, uh, I would say, um, challenges that we faced, which um, uh, I can explain. Sometimes you will find that you are missing breeding sites. Uh, it's not every small uh, water, the, the water bodies that have the, the mosquitoes breeding site. So sometimes you will focus on the other and miss the other one. And, with also the way the, the operation of drones are, you can easily, with the swath of the drone, you can easily miss in between the lines, uh, places where there might be uh, these breeding sites. So that was uh, a major uh, issue. And you can find as well ditch, uh, in ditches and uh, bushes, it's hard to find all the breeding sites. So um, there was also an inefficient use of chemicals. Because if you're spraying all over, you're going to spray, you're going to use a lot of, 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 of chemicals and sometimes spraying in areas where you don't need to be spraying. And some, in, it, it, in that method, it's not really cost effective. If you have a very huge field, let's say in, uh, in uh, um, uh, rice paddies, and you're trying to spray all over, then you're gonna, it's going to cost you a lot. And really, it's, it wasn't practical. Uh, you know, in large scale sense. So we, we started looking at what are the ways we can actually use drone technology and other methods to really narrow down and only target those small breeding sites that, um, that you know, obviously that has uh, mosquitoes uh, larvae there. So, um, and is with this approach where we worked with uh, various researchers and uh, within uh, uh, as well the government of Rwanda where we are using now machine learning and special algorithms plus drone in fighting these mosquito uh, based uh, uh, diseases, malaria for example. And so this is a GIS based approach. So basically what we'll be doing, we're actually doing now, is we fly over first with uh, various uh, cameras and sensors and where we start now um, taking various signatures of these breeding sites. They have various, you know, at different stages. So we're able to um, uh, collect data, understanding in various, you know, let's say even in rice paddies, you have di different levels of, uh, of growth of, of, of crops in there. So we collect at all those uh, stages and start developing models around that. And then we train our, the, the AI model to detect these breeding sites. And, um, after we start, you know, we, 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 we collect all that, we feed the, the, the data into uh, our uh, algorithm, and now we, we start detecting all the breeding sites in the field. So far, we've been able to accomplish that at 95%, and uh, we've done that, the, the testing in small areas, where we are able to send even uh, some, uh, um, to do some ground truthing, to making sure that our models is picking up the actual right uh, uh, breeding sites. 
And after we have all that in place, we uh, send a drone to do targeted spraying in those areas. And this method is really efficient in a way we are just targeting the places where uh, uh, we have breeding sites, we have uh, mosquito larva, and we ap apply precise you know, amount of uh, chemicals to uh, just enough uh, to, uh, um, to eliminate those larva, uh, larva uh, uh, areas and breeding sites. So the benefits of it is also, you know, you could, we, we could see it's accurate, less usage of uh, chemicals, cost effective in a sense that if we want to scale up this intervention into bigger area, we can easily do that. Um, and also it's a fast intervention, so it's, it's, it's really precise and uh, I, I believe it's, it's gonna be a, a new revolutionary way of targeting uh, these diseases. And not only that, we can start training, um, we're working again with another organization where they have issues with uh, different type of uh, 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 diseases as well that we can use this technology, we can transfer this technology to them so that in the, that manner of targeting spraying, we can also uh, use uh, this, uh, these models. So um, that was it for me. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and I will be looking forward to answer uh, your, your questions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Eric. I'm now, I'm now calling um, to the stage Wilson Kagabo, CEO of uh, Locus Dynamics. Hello, uh, good afternoon everybody. My name is uh, Wilson Kagabo. I'm the managing director of Locus Dynamics. <clears throat> Locus Dynamics is a systems engineering and integration company and we focus in the areas of aerospace, cybersecurity, uh, and uh, we also do homeland security solutions. Uh, I will try in this particular presentation to talk about uh, how to um, basically use, uh, adopt the technology, the drone technology in the African context. The, how can, can we make it easy to adopt the, the drone technology in the African context? <clears throat> so I'll start with the journey that we've come uh, through as a drone industry. Um, you're familiar with this uh, computer? This is where we came from. I found this online. It is uh, a picture from 1952, uh, Bell Labs. And this is how the computer looked like. This is how much we've come to uh, in terms of computing power. It's very important to understand that for us as a technology, uh, to be able to fit it into a drone we see today, there has been a lot of innovations happening in different fields. And I picked only three to highlight uh, uh, how that has influenced the drone technology and how that can now translate into the African context and be uh, easily adopted and you be used uh, in a more uh, better and uh, expanded way than we're using it today. Okay. Um, camera. This is basically a presentation of payload. This is where we've come uh, from as well. Uh, this is an area of photography of 1918 and uh, this picture doesn't do justice to compare, but you know the DJI uh, 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 ZX7, how, how small it is, basically. Uh, actually, the whole platform would be smaller than uh, the, 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 co the, the, the camera you see uh, uh, to your left, I believe. Okay. This is the battery technology. These are the three technologies I wanted to compare. That we, what we see here is that the benefits we see in a, um, high density, uh, uh, high power density uh, batteries that are coming up, the lithium bat polymer battery, the uh, helium uh, fuel cells in general that are also uh, putting a lot of uh, power into small batteries, is that the end result, the benefit is uh, in multiple times. We see that energy density increase compounded with a uh, cost reduction will lead into the efficiency and adaptation. And that leads to more investment uh, in manufacturing and more investment in R&D and the cycle goes on and goes on. Now, these three technologies or these three improvements have 
uh, led to a significant reduction in the kind of platforms we want. The platforms, uh, drone platforms, have become smaller, and, and now we're able to do many things uh, uh, with drones than we used to do uh, uh, in many years ago. So my topic now comes down. Now we, we know where we're coming from and uh, how the technology has evolved. How can we leverage these innovations, or what other innovations can we do in order to make this uh, uh, technology accessible and, uh, and usable on the African continent? We're using uh, the technology already. Eric and, uh, and uh, uh, Israel have already demonstrated what we do in Rwanda, but that's not the scale at which we want this technology to be used. I propose uh, three kinds of uh, uh, innovations, uh, engineering innovation, infrastructure innovation and supply chain innovations. If we want to see drones being used at larger scales in Africa, we ought to look into unique aspects on the African continent and consider those into engineering and design. Uh, we need to look at things such as uh, launch, uh, VTOLs versus catapults, and of course uh, versus land. You, you know, you, you're talking about an infrastructure of runway to be able to do a mapping of a larger scale. Is that a technology that's going to work for us? Or a VTOL which can take off at any location and achieve the same mission? Um, altitude versus range. These are trade-offs that we have to do. Uh, in a country like Rwanda, altitude is very important. At any point you stand, will be, he is probably 1.5 uh, kilometers uh, above sea level. Uh, you go to other places, you find it's very high. Our highest mountain is uh, 4.5 kilometer. This is called a land of a thousand hills. It's probably more than a thousand. I guess a guy stopped counting at 1,000. Uh, you, you ought to look into platforms and innovate platforms that are able to fly at high altitudes and be able to offer the kind of uh, uh, missions and advantages we want. Uh, beauty versus cost effectiveness. Um, I'm okay to buy a, a Ferrari, uh, but if I've got enough money to buy a Ferrari and do other things. But if it's only for transportation, I'm okay as well to ride a bike. And uh, that's the kind of uh, comparison I'm talking about here. Beautiful is, being beautiful is good. Uh, using very beautiful drones is nice looking, aerodynamically speaking, or ergonomically speaking, looking good is very nice. But in the end, it comes down, can it do the job? And at what cost am I willing to pay to do that job? On the African continent, that's a very big uh, 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 factor. C2 link, people who do uh, drones, you know that uh, data link is a very big factor. And uh, a country like Rwanda, where again you have a thousand hills, uh, every time you take off and you go BV loss, your chances are there's a hill and more, more other hills in between, and therefore you have to overcome C2 link challenges. Innovations need to happen in that area. And another innovation that is very much needed is multi-purpose uh, kind of drones. Um, if you, you've watched the way we do things around here is that if I have a car, it's probably the only car in the family, so we're gonna use it for taking kids to school, for shopping and, and, and picking up uh, stuff from the garden, and if I have to drop things there, I have to find a way to fit them, and I'll also collect some building materials, and if they can fit, I'll fit. Uh, this kind of uh, thinking has also to go into drones. Uh, the companies that do drone services in Africa, in one in particular, are small scale. They have uh, little cap uh, capex to start with. They want to have a workhorse, a drone that is able to swap uh, payloads or swap uh, 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 usage and be able to uh, perform more than just aerial mapping, but also do it. If it's doing spraying, can it also do something else that is not spraying? And that way, my market size is much bigger. The point I'm trying to make here is that one size doesn't fit all. And uh, this needs to be clear understood in the engineering. Supply chain. <laughs> Africa is perceived as a consumer market uh, of drones. And I want to give you a challenge. Try to figure out or find one company on African continent making drones on a commercial scale. Try to get one to me and tell me this one is doing so. Why? Because everybody who sees Africa, they will say, they will buy our drones. So manufacturers are coming in and say, can you buy drones? We have very fantastic. No one is saying, can I, I want to open a manufacturing facility here to bring uh, 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 the, 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 the drones and the uh, spare parts and the maintenance and support closer to you. That's a sort of a not thought about. 
It's very difficult to move uh, batteries around. I, I'm not going to labor much on this. I'm sure people who came here and probably those who are competing in the challenge, you understand that moving your batteries here was a big challenge. And the other one is spare parts that are uh, very hard. Answer to this is make locally, make locally, make local. I cannot overemphasize that. Try to localize production of all this. And uh, bottom line is that let the locals be in charge. Try to adopt the, tech, uh, the Toyota way of doing business, which is every time I go down the road within five kilometer radius, I'll probably find a mechanic who can fix my car or a spare part to replace mine. Business sustainability would depend on whether these guys in these pictures can do a part in the supply chain of drones uh, industry. And if your answer is no, you gotta do better than that, train more and uh, innovate more. If a structure that is common, that is able to deliver training requirement, testing, fabrication, maintenance, innovation incubators, the concept of drone operation center, either they call drone ports, these concepts need to be implemented in Africa. They bring cost to do business very low. They bring a critical mass together, and they help us move forward in a better way. You've seen uh, these pictures, these pictures, these pictures. They're all drone operation centers, concepts, and this one. With that, I end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wilson. I'm now calling to the stage uh, Tom Verbruggen, who is CEO of uh, Hydronect. Good afternoon. Very happy to be part of the ADF. I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of iDronect, a software platform that makes it easy to fly drones in a safe, legal, and efficient way. We've heard a lot of um, very useful use cases so far, uh, flood control, malaria treatment, etc. But there is something before that useful um, application can happen. And I want to talk to you about Peter. Peter is a photographer. Peter could also be a scientist or an inspector. And he's also a drone pilot. And Peter needs help. And why does he need help? Because before he can bring the value that drones can bring, Peter needs to do about 20 to 30 tasks before he actually can start flying. He needs to check whether he can fly in a certain area. He needs to check the weather. He needs to check special pilot information. He needs to make a flight plan, and so on, and so on. And often, he, he does that on many different applications. And what if you're a big operator? What if you have many drones? What if you're a big company? Then those problems become multiplied because now you also need to manage your assets, train your pilots, schedule flights, and so on. The facts are that nine out of 10 drone users are actually new to aviation. And aviation is the world that drones live in. What I've just shown you about Peter and big companies results in the fact that 80% of the time spent with drones, they're actually not flying. And in the flying is the value. So what we have built in 2015 We've built an all-in-one intuitive application that, all, that does all of that for the pilot. And we reverse the 80% into flying. We've got 48 features that we can group in, in three big categories. First of all, we make it safe to fly, we make it legal to fly, and we make it efficient. So we will see typically risk assessment, risk management. We will see real up-to-date aeronautical charts and UAV rules if they are in a certain country. We plan flights, we control them, and we even go so far as linking to authorities, linking to partners, and to linking to manufacturers. Our mission is to clear the air so pilots can focus on their mission and fly more. 
Now, the benefits that iDroneNet uh, delivers are that we make it safe, legal, and efficient to fly drones, and that we also connect the different partners in the drone ecosystem. We will connect pilots to authorities. We will uh, connect manufacturers to pilots. We are, at this moment, the most complete UAV management system. We don't call ourselves a UTM, but we integrate to a UTM. And our software can be used by individual pilots, enterprises, and authorities. Here they are. The, the people who can benefit from iDirect are individual pilots, bigger groups, drone ports, of which we just saw a few pictures, authorities, and drone schools. Our vision is that iDirect and the name that we chose actually has a little bit the connect in there. We want to connect the drone ecosystem. You see, all the players in the drone ecosystem can all connect to each other through iDronect. And uh, when I just said that uh, if there are any drone rules, people can actually start following quite, quite easily, intuit intuitively. Of course, you need to get those drone rules inside the system. So we built a rule editor that transforms any complex drone rule into an intuitive flow. And as we are here at the African Drone Forum, there are four things that uh, we developed specifically uh, for this forum. First of all is our new user experience. We combine all of the tasks that the pilot needs to do on one graphical interface. So we would, we would typically um, allow pilots to go and select the place where they're going to fly from. We're going to risk assess that flight by adding certain um, hazards, we're going to check the weather, we're going to allocate drones and pilots, and the system will then say if we're good to go to fly. And when that happens, we go fly. Second thing that we wanted to showcase at the uh, ADF is our virtual control tower. Virtual control tower is very interesting because it can be used by local authorities or by country uh, authorities to actually follow and track all of the drone flights that are happening on iDronect. Uh, even not only authorities, but big companies like uh, big fleets with 30 drones or something can check um, what the drones are flying at the moment. Are they, intend are they flying the intended flight? Third, what we want to show is the shortest way to drone value. Um, the circle that you see there is, in fact, a continuous loop where the drone delivers the value and what we do in that loop, we provide the automatic flight validation. So we prepare the flight and we check if a certain flight is good to go or not. And then the, drones, the drone go, goes and flies the mission, flies and captures the data, and so on. And then as last, we are very proud, and I will talk more about that tomorrow, but we are very proud of that, that we uh, launched iDronect East Africa specifically to support the, uh, the countries on the eastern part of the continent. I was Tom from iDirect. I'm very happy to take your questions uh, later. Thank you, Tom. And we'll now um, call Andrea Blindenbacher uh, to the stage. She is uh, the head of training at SenseFly. And she has been for quite a few years already, and she is also the president of uh, Drone Adventure, uh, which is an organization um, focused on doing good with drones. And I think she will be talking about that. Thank you very much, Antoine, for the introduction. Am I saying? Okay, perfect. So I'm Andrea. I'm president of Drone Adventures, an NGO that uses drones for good. We have been founded in 2013 upon doing some post-disaster mapping with the SenseFly EB in Haiti. Until now, we are a group of around 30 people where we consist of environmental engineers, aerospace en engineers, drone pilots, surveyors, and GIS specialists. We have done up to yeah, around 41 missions around the globe and have mapped around 500 square kilometers within that time. 
Most of the time we're working with other NGOs or universities that are looking for doing special projects where they're just looking for the outputs to do special analysis. When we go on missions, we usually end up in very tough terrain. It's harsh. It's hard to get there. Um, it's not easy to transport things. It can be hot, humid, cold, um, might be up high altitude. So we do need technology that can sustain all these conditions. On top of that, we also engage a lot with local community. So we try to build capacity. Ultimately, we want to do knowledge transfer, sh share our skills, and help the local community to potentially even use this technology themselves. So we need a robust, lightweight, and easy to use platform. Our most favorite at the moment is uh, the SenseFly EV. It's just it's a platform out of material that can very easily be repaired. It can be easily transported. It's up to 1.4 kilograms, if not less, depending on the generation of the EB. It can be carried on backpacks. It can be carried up mountains. If it does, and things do happen, gets a bit of damage. Most of the time, within 20 to 30 minutes, we are back up in air, being able to complete our missions. It's also very easy to learn. And eMotion, the flight planning software, is part of it. Because it's, the flight planning software has a simulator. So it lets you go into a classroom setting, and you can show the students or whoever is interested how, how drones fly. It can be even in 3D. One understands how waypoint flying functions. One can simulate warnings and errors and how to react to them, but also how to plan a successful mission because ultimately what you need, you would want this to be a tool to give you the result with which you're going to work with. Outside in the field, emotion is still flexible enough and yeah, adapts very well to any situation, so any complex terrain it's not a problem for this software and will make sure that your EB flies safely and collects the data that you need to create these kind of outputs. This is a 3D mesh, could also be a point cloud or automatic, and with this one could, for example, do an environmental study on that ice field that we see there, what happens with it over time. We go up there, we fly multiple times, we compare the data sets. This is an example from Lima, where it was about landslides assessment and the risk that these people have by living up on the slopes. So creating an automatic, printing it, putting it on paper, showing it to the local community allows them to point out where they see problems because they for sure have experience about the terrain, they have seen stuff happening. So spatial analysis happens automatically and at first set of risk assessment can be done. Here another example from Tanzania, and we heard some stuff about this already this morning. So creating an auto mosaic, which is then used to digitize or create the vectorial maps, which can then be used for cadaster, can enable a local a community to prosper and a, and a government to actually start organize things properly. Capacity, capacity building is our main goal, so we were big time involved in the Zanzibar mission. We were out there, we were on the start, we helped the people, we trained them up. Uh, we were there when drones broke down, we would help them repair them, we'd show them how to repair them, etc. So, and from this mission, actually, several other companies have evolved and created jobs for people, for more people around that area. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Andrea. And to close this first series of uh, speaker, I will call um, Alex Entale, who is the CEO of the Rwanda ICT Chamber.
Hi, good afternoon. Um, mine is not a presentation, but I want to welcome those, uh, our visitors who've come to Rwanda for the first time. As I said, my name is Alex Sinhari, and I'm the CEO of Rwanda ICD Chamber. Uh, Rwanda ICD Chamber is a member-based organization. We have over 300 uh, members. These are technology companies, uh, ICT and digital that are as you had it yesterday, we have this mission or vision of building uh, Rwanda into Africa's technology hub. And what we do uh, at the chamber is working with the companies, uh, facilitating technology companies that uh, are actually making that a reality. Uh, already we have uh, representatives that are here that, that have shown you their, their work. Um, I'm here really to speak, uh, just to talk about uh, a little bit on uh, what we do and how that connects, uh, most like, uh, connects to what uh, your company, your organization uh, may be doing. Uh, our five, uh, we have five uh, strategic pillars that drive uh, our vision or our mission. And these are uh, uh, driving digital innovation. Uh, with this, we work with a young um, companies, uh, they don't need to be or to have been started by young people, uh, which uh, although they, they, that tends to be the case uh, on the continent uh, for sheer reason that uh, that's what the, demograph uh, the demographies actually uh, indicate. And with these, we have innovation spaces, uh, incubation hubs. Uh, yesterday, you probably heard about uh, the Fab Lab, uh, K Lab, and other uh, co-working spaces as uh, Dr. Kamau uh, demonstrated uh, the, the hundreds of them across the continent. And through these, we've seen emergence of new uh, innovations, new technologies. Uh, some of these companies are actually leading uh, on the market uh, in, in terms of leading market share uh, in, the, uh, in the economy. And uh, I need not uh, point to, uh, to some of the, those that are here on the stage. The second part is digital uh, business competitiveness, uh, where we work with companies on uh, growing them. How do we facilitate uh, a company that is existing in a market uh, to grow their business, to grow uh, their best, uh, both uh, quantitative as well as qualitative uh, uh, measures? Of course, on the qualitative, you're looking at uh, skills, uh, upskilling, but also making sure that you have the right talent um, with you, and as well as not just uh, competitiveness locally, uh, but uh, as well as looking at what's out there and how uh, that company can grow. Now, the third part is what uh, probably uh, concerns uh, people that are, that are in this room, um, which is digital transformation. And we're part of the Private Sector Federation, which has more than 75 uh, associations, uh, business sector associations. Uh, these are from agriculture to mining to real estate. And um, the use cases that have been presented here, uh, most of them, when you look at them, uh, they're not necessarily serving uh, the technology sector uh, per se, but rather they are either serving uh, infrastructure challenges, they are serving the medical space, they are serving uh, uh, agriculture, and that's where uh, participants that are here, uh, that's where you come in. And what uh, we have done uh, recently um, in the 75 associations that we have in the Federation, we've uh, started a drone and robotics association that uh, to date has uh, slightly more than slightly over 10 people, 10 uh, companies uh, that are in the uh, in the sector, and including uh, research uh, research labs. And what I'm here to really uh, talk to you about is. Uh, just throw out a call for those companies that are coming in. Yesterday you had the minister allude to the fact that Rwanda is a proof of concept uh, country. We have a testament uh, here on the stage uh, from Zipline that uh, kicked off the operations here. So what we have uh, is an environment, an enabling environment uh, that looks or seeks 
out companies that want to bring products, that want to bring new solutions uh, to market, but at the same time, uh, as Wilson uh, mentioned, that understands local contexts and uh, really is willing and uh, wants to work uh, with, the, with, with the local community. As a private sector, of course, as a government, uh, they, won't, uh, they, they, don't, they won't care what uh, necessarily who, they, they, there's no restriction, so to speak. It's a liberal economy that you can work with. But we believe that um, B2Bs, uh, collaborations um, that seek out win-to-win, win-win -win, um, um, uh, situations will actually uh, help companies uh, that are really at the very at the forefront of uh, the drone industry uh, to grow and expand, not just in Rwanda but also in the continent. And with that, um, uh, just want to focus which areas really uh, we had a lot about skills development. Uh, we still every uh, booth I've visited. I think I've had uh, drone pilots mentioned um, every now and then, oh, our, we have a challenge that our drones, we need to have uh, skilled people on ground. So for companies that may be in that, uh, we're keen uh, on most of the things that Wilson mentioned uh, to look at the value chain. Uh, if you're building out a business or if you're trying to offer a solution, um, how do we build entire uh, value chain in order to make this sustainable? Because one thing uh, here and there, it just makes it uh, overly uh, expensive and therefore uh, you lose uh, the competitiveness. So uh, that's pretty much it. Um, research and development, uh, universities, uh, companies that are looking to do uh, to, to do POCs, uh, I'm here, I'm available to, to discuss and to uh, help make connections that you may need. So thank you very much, and that's all I would say. Thank you very much, uh, Alex. So we have uh, for ourselves uh, 15, 20 minutes to uh, continue the, the discussion in more uh, details. Um, and for, for the benefit of promoting innovation, techn technological innovation and, and progress, I would like to focus my questions on what uh, could work better in the, um, in the operations um, as of today. Um, some of you have presented the successes. Uh, usually we don't like to uh, um, present the failures, but uh, uh, these are the things we use to, uh, to progress. Um, maybe the first aspect I want to, to, to ask, ask you about is software. I know for experience that software is a huge part of uh, mounting a drone operation, um, be it for the actual monitoring of the drone, but uh, uh, we can talk about data processing, operational support, uh, fleet management, supply chain integration, um, as Israel was um, mentioning, uh, ob even obtaining certification might require some, some software support. Um, yet, we have many drone manufacturers talking about their physical platform and relatively few um, software provider. Thank you, Tom, for uh, being there um, with us. Um, what, um, what is... Uh, your feeling about that? Do you find, as operator, that you have that you are adequately supported by the available support, uh, software, or you find yourself needing uh, developing your own? Maybe uh, Israel, do you want to start? Sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think Zipline's experience was when we started, uh, when the founders thought of starting Zipline, they were doing off-the-shelf software. Um, and, and you know, trying to integrate it into the different devices that they were making at that point. But when you come to the point where you have to um, operate at national scale, you have to make several flights, you have to integrate the national airspace, and you have to provide a solution for air, air navigation services, what we know as UTM and so on, it, it kind of revealed that there was a need to as much as we built the hardware part of the drone, we had to build the software part as well. Um, and, and it's the whole system. It's not even the drone only. It's, we use a catapult. We use a recovery system. 
uh, we have a power system because you know hospitals rely on us for their passion so that means that everything at the distribution center has to be perfect and so that's why you know before even starting in Rwanda we outsourced uh, we kind of brought back software inside the company and it's a it's like a huge part of the company itself uh, and that allows us for example you know to analyze the data in real time because as soon as the drone returns and we put back the battery on the charger we download all the data and we can understand in real time what's happening and make sure you release uh, the software updates that you need to continue operation uh, to make sure that you know you remain as dependable as the health facilities expect you to be and and that's like also being able to build an integrated software platform right when we are packing our you know medical products and scan the packages and the, the units that information has to be transferred to the drone and that has to be very seamless and you know in Rwanda for example in particular we don't only integrate the airspace but we have different stakeholders who has to make sure that uh, like security organs they have to know where we are at all times and they have to have a view and direct access to what the client is doing so there is all those needs and it kind of uh, makes it really important that software becomes a huge component of the company but equally big as you know the manufacturing is as uh, also the health operations is pretty much of course what's uh, maybe uh, eric uh, on a s smaller scale operation uh, what's your uh, feel on on the, the software you had to develop your uh, or co-develop your own uh, um, image analysis software for example uh, do you find uh, yourself often blocked by the lack of available software for, for drone operations? Um, yeah, in general, the, there is a, a certain level of limitation. Um, uh, but it arrives when you start going into more specialized um, type of uh, operation. Because when you are just doing um, what everyone else is doing, and um, most of the time, the software developers are looking at their market, like how much people they can fit into the same category. But when you start doing, for example, what you're doing in the malaria uh, type of uh, intervention, you find the need to start customizing or co-developing, as you say, or developing yourself, certain software to help, you, to help you, uh, address certain of, uh, issues that you are facing. So, uh, in general, I think I would approach that question. The, the, the answer to that question would be of twofold, depending on really the, the, the type of complexity of the operation that you are doing. Uh, we find that there is uh, a certain lack of, of uh, uh, the software side of it, but if you are just doing the general, then I think uh, as of now, there is a, a, a type of a more um, um, accessible, easily accessible software that you can use for general type of operation. And one thing I want to touch on as I, um, is also uh, the need of, as Wilson said, to customize it based on, let's say, Africa in context. Sometime earlier on, we had a lot of uh, uh, issues when we're doing, for example, mapping. Sometimes the terrain following features you have, um, for example, uh, you will find that uh, in certain part of Africa, we don't have those data that are not available there. So, and you are limited. So, uh, but, um, and that's still a challenge of, as of now. So, uh, I guess the, uh, the manufacturers, I think, they should also think not only on their platform, but more on the software and where they're going to use it. If it's Africa, then there is a level of customization you need to think about as well. Maybe, maybe Tom, you want to react on, on that since you have announced something specifically for Africa? Um, yeah, I think the um, the answer is correct that uh, there should be like an um, an evergreen solution um, to the to the problem that uh, that uh, that drones are facing, which is uh, we want to maximize the uh, the opportunities that drones give us by then also minimizing the risks. Um, and and some operators or hardware providers they will start building their own their own software. Um, because of the, the value that that hardware provides, yet the, the, the problematic of, of getting the value into the air would then need to be solved by, uh, by, by a generic uh, evergreen solution. Um, and that is why I think when, we, when, when your question goes about uh, why, we, why we go to Africa, is because I think that the, um, the speed at which um, Va drone value is being delivered in, val in, in Africa at this moment is very high, and the support uh, is, is, is needed at this, at this stage, and that's why we, we do that. In the spirit of uh, producing locally, 
um, is uh, the ICT uh, is the software and maybe redirecting uh, existing software capabilities in other domain uh, to the drone domain is something you're looking at at the uh, ICT chamber? Uh, uh, yes, and I think when we when we talk about producing locally, we also need to look at the the skill sets. Uh, what competitive uh, skills do you have, or can you um, ca can you start with? And for uh, f for Rwanda in particular, uh, we've also clearly mapped out our software buildings capacities and skill sets uh, along the software curve. Uh, that's why you have camp. Uh, uh, campuses or universities like Carnegie Mellon University that are set up here, Africa, Uni um, Africa Institute of Mathematical Sciences that is here. You had a lot of work being done along lines of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all these uh, universities, the reason they've been attracted here or the reason they've been invited here is to see as a landlocked country uh, how do we leverage uh, that, uh, the zeros and ones, because it's been, at least uh, until now, it's been a little bit hard uh, to get into the game that uh, has hardware. Uh, that being said, um, we're beginning to see uh, the hardware space also being democratized in the sense that uh, from computer-aided design, computer-aided manufacturing, um, small side 3D printing and uh, CNC machines that are affordable and uh, materials that can quickly be uh, shipped or uh, yes, quickly shipped uh, and brought to uh, inland uh, Africa. So that is also likely to change as we, uh, as uh, as digital continues to disrupt uh, most of the traditional uh, models of uh, manufacturing. Of Can I add something? Sure. I think just as he's talking, I, I just remember another point, which is the necessity or the importance of the ecosystem when you are talking about software. Uh, I think there is a myth around the fact that it's, it's all about making a machine know what to do, but it's more on the diversity of software skills as well that come in, or engineering skills in general. Um, and that's something that Zipline learned the hard way. For example, the need to have a software or an engineer dedicated to weather issues, for example or another one dedicated to you know, sense and avoid and so on. So I, I just wanted to point out the need also like of a variety and the ecosystem aspects that really has to come together uh, in terms of being able to do that. Sometimes it can be within a company, sometimes it can be just outside the company and, uh, and built around that. And that, that's the importance of the initiatives like, uh, like Kate just mentioned. I think the, multi, uh, just wanna, the multidisciplinary aspect because the skill sets that you need to build uh, software, or it could be drawn or anything, that is needed for construction uh, sites is different for agriculture because you need uh, someone who understands NDVI, what is it all about, and then someone else who understands how, what exactly infrastructure uh, they're looking for in, in civil aviation, uh, civil, uh, civil works. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there is another uh, topic I would like to uh, to address, uh, maybe in the categories of the, the frustration, is the, the question of the cost and uh, the profitability of uh, drone um, drone operations. Um, have you, on, on the field, found yourselves? Um, I mean, technology as a cost. As, have you found yourself on the field uh, thinking that maybe you want, you would like a bit less technology because you don't really need it in order to optimize the uh, optimize the cost of your operation? And generally, how do you feel um, all the um, the current offering in terms of drone is is addressing the question of uh, of uh, profitability uh, in in operation in Africa, uh, where uh, capex are typically uh, not as uh, available as uh, in, in, in Europe or the Western world? I'm happy to start. I think I'd, we had the usual suspects when those kind of questions come up, so uh, I'm not escaping it at this point. Um, I, I talked about something earlier about you know us not identifying ourselves as a drone operator but as a medical delivery service provider. and. And one of the things we really had to learn, and, and me specifically in my role at the company, is to really go out there 
um, talk with government officials, talk with health systems leaders, and really understand like what is a real headache that you have that don't think about the drone, just think about a solution that allows you to move a product from one place to another within less than 45 minutes, um, a, a solution that allows you to serve more than 300 locations from one single point. What pain point, what value, and what interest does that have for you? And then whatever the outcome that that thing is, that value that it adds, can you put a cost to it? And, and that's where you, you start like, thinking again and backward you think about, it's not about selling the drone or the flight or the delivery, it's more about what is the value that's behind it. And that, that's something we learned as, as Zipline where we look at, you know, we are not only delivering a package from point A to point B, but what are the efficiencies that we are building in the health systems? What are the efficiencies that we're allowing a company that wants to be able to have much more visibility or direct access to their customers regardless of where they are? Like those kind of things. That, and, and usually that, from a business perspective, that ends up being a, um, a highly valuable uh, thing that anyone is ready to be able to buy into and, and make a companies like Zipline uh, either really appealing to investors and, and really put us on a good path to profitability as a business as well. Um, it's, it's just about, you know, less looking at the technology itself, but more looking at the value that you're providing. Uh, and you, you model your technology around that to be able to do that. And, and also, I guess, the total cost of ownership of a system, including the maintenance and how long it's going gonna, it's gonna to last. You go first? I, I was going to talk about the profitability. I think uh, it's a function of uh, at what uh, the time uh, you, you become profitable. Eventually, you become profitable, but you have to endure some days of drought. And uh, it may take longer. Some of the things that we do at Locus Dynamics is that we diversify our business offering, that we're not relying only on one specific service. So I told you we're a systems engineering integration company. We're doing drone services. We're delivering systems. We're uh, doing uh, cybersecurity. So we have diversification. When one part of the business is not uh, enough to sustain uh, the business for long term, we've got other areas that are sustaining the business, sustaining uh, the, 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 uh, our path to growth, and eventually other areas that are doing slowly will catch up and uh, will, overall you'll be profitable. But uh, if you just pick one area and say I'm a mapping company and I'm looking at the market in Rwanda and uh, you, know, you want to get profit, uh, profitable in one year, the quick answer that is not political is no. Maybe, uh, Andre, you want to, uh, to, to react to, to that? You, you talked about um, um, capacity building um, in, uh, in Zanzibar, for example. Uh, when those capacities are transferred to the local population, uh, can they actually, with the business, uh, um, access the, those, those drones, those materials uh, that they need, or do they need further uh, support? How, how does that... Uh, happens yeah, so far they definitely need further support that what I've seen a bit everywhere in the world uh, especially the, the, the poorer areas or where you transfer those skills they, there is not necessarily yeah enough money around to yeah to su support these sort of westernized products if the manufacturers don't like adapt pricing, for example, for certain regions, etc., or provide uh, other solutions or other ways to help these clients become profitable quicker. Eric, you wanted to add something on the on the on the on the on the cost of the the systems. Yeah. Um, and how it yeah, affects sure. I think uh, they've, uh, my colleagues have answered uh, most of it, and especially on the divers, uh, d diversifying your, your 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 services and all over. So, and that's what really Caris ha has done a lot, and not only locally, but uh, trying to move uh, um, in the region and, and beyond. Because on one you know one area, it's not enough to sustain your business, but also on the other side, obviously, uh, the, the technology is, I would say, relatively new and uh, in the constant context of using it in our daily uh, lives. So 
um, and uh, the cost is still high in terms of even acquiring the equipment to those who acquire the equipment, even the development. So one, I was in really uh, fascinated about some models that people uh, are coming up with, a very interesting, innovative way of also stru structuring that cost. And some I've seen have started leasing, for example, uh, which is a very, uh, I believe, uh, nice uh, approach of helping those who want to acquire the technology uh, start you know, getting hands on that and also trying to reduce the cost of operation because at the end of the day if we don't reduce the cost then there is you know as Israel said there was it will be very hard for the population for the farmer to work, uh, adopt the technology so those are the things that we need to think about and uh, even more so in the context of Africa thanks thank you very much um, I think we will uh, close this panel uh, by taking a few questions from the audience, if there are any. There is one question, two questions. Any other question? So we'll quickly take those two questions and then uh, let the panelists address them. Um, hello, Tilo from Wingcopter. I have a question about the operation from Zipline. And you are mentioning that you're tracking flight data to improve the operation and the mission planning. Um, could you go a little bit more into detail, like what flighters are interesting for you? How are you able to track them during the flight? And um, how does this affect your operation planning? Thank you. Maybe you want to answer directly, Israel. Yes, so if I understand your question well, you're asking about you know, the flight data that we collect, what kind of data we collect, and how, do we, how does that affect our operations, and how does that work? Um, so the, the drone, as, as you probably have seen it if you visited us, is equipped with different um, data captures. We really want to understand what it is that the drone is encountering whenever it's flying. Uh, and it's everything, really, that it encounters from wind speed, wind direction, how the drone is reacting and communicating itself uh, in addressing different solutions, how the motors are, are reacting to, I don't know, a downdraft or, uh, you know, when it's landing to make a delivery, like everything, every single thing that happens to the drone from when it, it, it starts its flight from a distribution center to when it lands. Um, the way we do it, uh, our drone are usually through the battery are equipped with, um, you know, kind of data loaders, if you'd say, that really collect that data. And as soon as we put back the battery, they will upload it on our, uh, on our servers. And in real time, we can start analyzing. Uh, we also have a flagging system, for example. We know uh, different categorizations of the data, so we can tell a flagging system of, you know, this particular thing happened to the drone someone should look into it. It was a nominal flight, no one need to look into it. And that flagging system allow us to detect, for example, uh, you know, one motor wasn't really turning at the right rate or, you know, the wind and, and something, you know, disturbed it. And, and that flagging system on different parts of the drones that we think are critical uh, allow us to really know what to do about that. And the good thing about to having an internal software team is that we can deploy either patches in terms of fixes uh, overnight before we start operation again. We can halt operation for a few minutes to fix something that way, or we, we just deploy different software releases on a regular basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, depending on the need and, and what it is that we are addressing. But it also allows us, the most importantly, is to build the system and reinforce it on the go, right? So sometimes you need the basics, but over time you kind of figure out other things that you just push into the software. Like, for example, something as, uh, as putting a reverse thrust on the motors, like allowing motors to turn in different directions to reduce speed while making a delivery. That's something you, you've already built the motor to do that, but the software probably kind of improves to adapt to those things. So it's a lot of things that happens there, and, and it's something that we do on the go pretty much. I hope that answers your question. There was another question. Is the question still valid? Mm -hmm. Ah, there is one question there. My name is Amos Pires. I want just to ask about security. So uh, you see someone can try to disturb your operations, like jamming your drones. So I wanted to know if you have started to think about that issue. Thank you. Uh, 
I guess that question is uh, open to everybody to answer for us. I did talk about engineering innovation. Uh, that has to do with uh, um, looking at the, your, securing your, your, your communication uh, data link. Uh, at Locus Dynamics, we're looking at different ways to do that. Uh, one is uh, encryption for sure. Uh, most drone data links are going to be encrypted. Uh, but we're also looking at uh, frequency hooping as a way of uh, avoiding uh, uh, um, uh, jamming as well. Uh, but you're getting into uh, more robust military grade type of drones when you start talking about uh, about those kind of uh, 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 data communication security mechanisms. Uh, not many commercial drones do have that, but we as a, a systems engineering company, yeah, we, we, we do take that as part of our design process. Yeah, I would like that maybe to that because that's, uh, that's of course, a, a, te a technical solution where you prevent um, jamming or, or anything. There is also a preventative method, of course, and that is trying to make it as easy as possible to fly uh, in a legal way. Um, and, and that is that uh, as soon as the, all the drones that are flying around are the ones that, that, that can be um, monitored and be, be controlled, it, it, it singles out the ones that are not following the, 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 the rules uh, as such. So that would be a preventative me measure. Thank you very much. Well, in the interest of time, I think we'll uh, leave it at this. Um, thank you again for your uh, presentation. I think we can uh, give you a round of applause. I, unfortunately, I don't think that Rosa is uh, scheduled for this one panel, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. And um, you can uh, uh, get to your seat. And without any further transition, I will ask Tom Plummer, the CEO of Wingcopter, to uh, be the to give the first talk of this um, second um, part. <laughs>